Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are gathered today on the 28th of the 12th month. Thank you, Sister Cindy. And it is the 9th of March on 2024 on the Gregorian calendar. <clears throat> and as last week, we went over a little bit of a segue showing the book of Te Taffy and some foretellings that were in there, actual foretelling of future events before they happened, right? When you look into the history of the Irish bard songs, how long they've been known, when that book was published, and then the events that we just covered, some amazing information in there. But, um, and it also corroborates what we have in foretellings in scripture in Yehezkiel or Ezekiel 17, as we as you recall, or if you recall, if not, you can go over the video from last week, and then you can read that for context. But right here is another section of, of a different thing I wanted to share. When you are familiar with the series, The Antichrist for Dummies, which we talk about quite often, and you know about how Revelation is actually to be interpreted with the signs in the skies and the corresponding events on earth, or in the land, if you will, um the founding of america the idea of the popular government to have liberty of conscience to serve your creator according to the dictates of your own will that was the gift that was brought from that cromwell revolution that budding republic that did not force christmas on people was brought to america and the popular government that we established was the bane of Satan and all the monarchs of the world, which was what caused them to have their black conspiracy called the Holy Alliance, which we'll come over in some other time. But the idea that America was foretold isn't just novel. It isn't just in scripture, just like the foretellings in Tay Taffy and how she was being brought to Ireland was mentioned in Yehezkiel by Yirmiyahu, his commission. And then you can actually see it happen in those writings. The foretelling of America was also mentioned elsewhere, both in scripture and not. This book, it's an older book, right? 1866. It's called the letter carrier, footprints of a letter carrier, or a history of the world's correspondence. Okay, containing biographies, tales, sketches, incidents, and statistics connected with postal history. And I know that doesn't sound overly um, exciting or anything. Or you know, why would we have that to do with? But it actually has some very interesting things in it if you take the time to look. One of them happens to be a foretelling from a gentleman that they call Merlin, who is a Welsh man from the 8th century. And his foretelling was recorded in writing in the 1530s that they still had available at the time of the founding of our nation, when a man reading that said, ah, this is about us, and actually had it published and made known. And that got carried over into here. So with that, I would like to share. I wanted to give you the title real quick and then... I believe the part we have in question is on chapter 10, Reminiscence, or Reminiscence. If I'm saying that right, please forgive me. You, you'll notice, enacted according to an act of Congress, right? And the clerk's office of the district court in the United States for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. So according to an act of Congress, this was copywritten or put on record at a clerk's office in a court in Pennsylvania. And you could do this in any clerk's office in anywhere in the country and have it valid. But we don't know how to do these things anymore because we've lost, uh, we're ignorant of a great many things. But if we read the Constitution and we repented of our breaking of his ways, we would start to know what we're doing. Um, not to get too far into that, I really want to share some amazing things, so we'll want to touch upon those. I'm trying to get 
past this. I, I encourage you, if you want to read it, this book is available online. I actually found this through an internet search where I was looking up things about the founding of our country. Now, I'm not going to get into all that. I was trying to show you right here. You want chapter 10 starts on page 156. All right, and this really does have a smorgasbord of uh, a huge variety of things in it. Um, you, you can peruse them at your leisure. There might be other gems. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it does have some very interesting things. And if you have any, any love of history or anything of that nature, very worthwhile. <clears throat> but right here, this is the section at hand. It says... As everything having any connection with the events of 1776, which led to our independence, must be of interest, it may not be out of place here to introduce the following remarkable prophecy made in the 8th century by Merlin, a celebrated Welsh astrologer. Now, I can't speak to whether or not he was an astrologer, but astrology is one of the pinnacles of witchcraft. It's nothing to do with the believer, and it doesn't have a good end. I can't say that he actually was, but even Bilam foretold. So please don't discredit this because of whoever wrote this is opinion right here. That may not even be accurate. And that was one of my mentions, like, I don't speak evil of people. I don't know this man or what he's done. Just like I don't know Ignatius of Antioch any more than I do uh, Hermas, the one who wrote The Shepherd of Hermas. You can only judge a book by its content, not its cover, right? So you look at what the men say to themselves or about what men have firsthand accounts of them that they said in their presence to their face or in a court of law. And they weren't, you know, there was no defamation. Those are facts, you know, things you can prove. But just speaking evil of someone because you feel like it, it does not have a good end. So it says, um, its fulfillment in almost every particular renders it the more interesting as evidenced in the American Revolution, to which reference seems to have been made. Had this foretelling been published subsequent to the revolution, its authenticity might have been doubted or at least questioned, but it is copied from Hawking's work published in the year 1530. In connection with the foretelling, we also give the key furnished by an old citizen of Philadelphia to the editors of the Columbian Magazine. Now, America was originally called Columbia as a form of derision and pictured as a half-naked semi-feral, um, you know, half Indian woman. But Columbia was from Columbus, and it means literally um, the county or the district of the Dove. And that will come in later on. That's both foretold in Revelation, or in Scripture, as you'll see, and right here. But it was published by an old citizen in Columbian Magazine, published in this city in the March number 1787. And he put Sibylline Oracle. The Sibylline Oracles, if you're not familiar, are a collection of writings that were originally held by the Greeks and the Romans um, of foretellings given by their Sibyls, female prophetesses, if you will that good, bad, or ugly, they foretold a great many things, including the future judgment, the almighty eternal father, um, the coming judgment by fire. There, there's a lot of things that they're actually quoted by the apostolic constitutions in 
proving the resurrection and how the Greeks should not think that it's absurd to hold to the Hebrew doctrine when their own female prophetesses profess these things. But um, this instance has nothing to do with the Sibylline uh, oracles. So I'm not sure why they put the title there. <clears throat> it says, uttered by Merlin sometime during the 8th century in Wales, of which he was a native. It says, when the savage is meek and mild, the frantic mother shall stab her child. When the cock shall woo the dove, the mother, the child, shall cease to love. So that means the child will cease to love the mother when the cock is wooing the dove. Okay. When men, like moles, work underground, the lion, a virgin true, shall wound. When the dove and cock, the lion, shall fight, the lion shall crouch beneath their might. When the cock shall guard the eagle's nest, the stars shall rise all in the west. When ships above the clouds shall sail, the lion's strength shall surely fail. When Neptune's back with stripes is red, the sickly lion shall hide his head. When seven and six shall make but one, the lion's might shall be undone. And what they call the lion here, as we'll see, is called the dragon in Revelation in these instances. And both of these are significant and foretelling because the lion is the moniker given to Yahuda and all the monarchies from which his children derive and reign. And you can see that through their emblems all throughout Europe. <clears throat> it is all throughout scripture as well. Even you, our Mashiach comes as the lion of the tribe of Yahuda. And that's a picture of the type of monarch and what they represent. Okay. The dragon is specifically a emblem that was picked up by uh, the Danai, the snake and the lion from the fall of Troy in Greece. It was adopted by the Romans and taken by them, by Brutus, to, or I say Romans, but Rome was not created then, by the fallen ones of Troy, the pagan Trojans that went to Italy, that joined with the Latinum Confederation, that became one people within two generations, Brutus left and Romulus and Remus uh, were there. Romulus killed Remus and founded sit the city of Rome in his blood. So context there. But Brutus would have taken that emblem of the dragon from that time with him over. And it was it has been the symbol of the monarchy of Britain from that time. And it was during this time as well as it was foretold in Revelation. So not only was there authority and power based off the dragons, which was Rome's, or what we call civil law, municipal law, Justinian code, canon law, name it what you want, it's man-made traditions and laws contrary to, and in their opinion, superseding the law of the Almighty as opposed to what we have in our country and Britain and Australia and places of that nature, which is the common law, what we call the common law, which is literally the Ten Commandments, the, the mitzvot or the right rulings right there from Exodus chapter 21 to 23. And then you got the smarting of them through Leviticus and some others with the feasts. That is the common law. That is the law of the land for America, for Britain. It's what everyone who sits in a jury, trial by jury, is to judge by. And when they don't, that judgment falls on them, which is why we have so much people under curses in our countries. But that's for another time right now. The point is, the common law is literally scripture. You can trace it back all the way to Molmontis, the Celtic king 
of the 7th century BC where he codified it. And it was later recodified by Alfred the Great. And we have those records in, in the, we know what the dooms contained. I just told you the first section of it was the Ten Commandments, although the second commandment was on the bottom because he had to restore it from the Latin version where they had thought to change times and laws. They removed the second commandment and split the tenth in half. Um, it, that was restored. And then the right rulings, literally chapters 21 through 23 of Exodus, every bit of it, that is the covenant that he gave to the children. That is the common law that our country functions other, under. That's why Andrew Jackson said that our country is where every man is beholden to keeping the commandments of Elohim. And that's why he said it's the Bible is the foundation upon which the Republic stands. But we don't get taught these things because Jesuits and others, enemies of our nation, Satanists, have overthrown our country covertly, part of that third woe, again, mentioned in the Antichrist for Dummies, mentioning Gad the Seer, literally foretellings about what would happen that have been fulfilled. So um, I don't want to get too dis distracted about all of that. I want to get back into this again. But the lion represents Yahuda, the monarchy here. It's also remnant, or it's pointed out as the dragon in Revelation in those foretellings, okay? And here's the explanation of it. We'll just go by, I'll read through it. Verse one, the settlement of America by a civilized nation is very clearly alluded to in the first line. When they're meek and mild, so after they're not fighting, if you recall, or if you don't know, at Lexington and Concord, they had to be defensive. John Knox knew it, and it was his doctrine that was purported and known in America that no Christian nation, no real believing nation, as they called themselves because they didn't know better, can be can be aggressors in war. You had to be defending yourself, defending your country. And that's why they stood the line. They didn't attack. They stood the line and were shot at. And then they returned fire and left the field of battle and they were able to now protect themselves against a, a, a foreign aggressor. But it says, the frantic mother is Britain. America still feels the wounds she has received from her. Remember, this was written in 1866. Verse 2, the cock is France. Anyone can look up the cock in France and see that's a fact. Okay. The dove is America. Again, specifically, the District of Columbia is the dove, right? reminiscent of the dove that founding of our country and then he even mentions it right here columbia because that's the etymology of what columbia columb is a dove columbus is the dove and then the ia right here is the district or the uh, area the county of if you will so it says their union is the epoch when america shall cease to love britain which is exactly what happened all right. Verse three, in many parts of Europe, there are subterranean works carried on by persons who never see the light of day. And that was becoming prevalent at that time. But perhaps the solution may more particularly be referred to the siege of York in Virginia, where the approaches were carried on by working in the earth. And that was the earth opened up and swallowed up the waters that were spewed forth by the dragon the mouth of the dragon foretold then too and that was the uh, siege works that were first um <clears throat> i'm sorry the engineering work that was first done by george washington and his men where they had to dig trench lines at the night to get the cannons close enough to be able to fire on them or else they would have just been wasted trying to get there but it says, in the second line, there is another equivoque, we are told by Mr. Addington in his Spectator, that a lion will not hurt a true maid. This, at first view, seems to be contradicted by the prophecy or foretelling. 
but on examination the epoch referred to the virgin columbia or perhaps virginia by which name all north america was called in the days of queen elizabeth okay it was called virginia so the virgin shall wound the lion that is britain which shows the precise time when the oracle should be accomplished it was when virginia okay it was the virginia constitution that was first made and i highly encourage you read it you're going to find elements of the declaration of independence in there it was created first and in there there's also the declaration of the laws which is what we call a bill of rights which goes into even more detail than the bill of rights in the constitution that is the also one of our founding documents that most people have absolutely no idea even exists <clears throat> verse four it says clearly alludes to the successes of the united forces of america and france against those of britain verse five for the solution of this oracle as well as all the rest we are indebted to the engraving of the arms of the united states in the Colombian magazine for September 1786. And the arms of the United States, if you remember, was there was a committee with, I believe, Adams, Franklin, and Jefferson to come up with the, the emblems, if you will. And none of them came up with something satisfactory to the, the, the whole group's entire uh, consent there. The most biblical version was actually given by the Freemason Franklin. And while, yes, I do believe he was a full-on Freemason, he, we don't have full history. We, we jump on things and we get ignorant blanket statements and accusations. George Washington was also a Freemason. And by his own admission, he did it to spy on them. So he didn't trust them as an organization. Supposedly supposedly right and th these are the things these are facts you can read it and then you can either come up with what you want or you can just take facts as they are now the uh the men that are nobody's perfect at, right some men are more inclined to perfection than others and when you hear the truth and you turn to it with all your heart if you really believe you will never taste death at all Hanach, Eliyahu, Baruch, and Ezra are four examples, at least, of men who've never died and are in paradise today because of their hearing the truth and conforming to it without complaining, right? And then knowing it was ignorance that kept them in, in evil. But um, most men are not like that. And I can't say george washington one way or another i don't know the man but i know that every country gets the leadership they deserve and our country's founding was foretold his being in that position was foretold he was miraculously protected in battles um there's stories about the indians multiple shots they focused on all of the officers on horses he could not be killed although he had four he had multiple horses shot out from under him and he had multiple holes in his jacket, but he was unscathed. Um, and they had actually realized the Indians that were fighting him he eventually stopped and realized that he, he couldn't be held. The great spirit was protecting him. <clears throat> Just like Abraham Lincoln was the leader that we deserved at the time, and he is absolutely a martyr. At the taking over of our country, he was killed as a representation of that very phenomenon happening. But these are these are things for a different time it's to help us know what's going on to perceive what is and things of that nature so back on point the gentleman that created the emblems there was thomas i'll have to get his name to know it again but i believe it was a thomas something and he was also the gentleman that wrote the first english translation of the septuagint into english from the greek in america or anywhere he was the first to do it that version isn't 
very available. He also wrote a synoptic good news account based off of that. Um, but he was very cognizant of the scriptures. And when they were at a stalemate for what to do, he was inquired into, came up with it in about a week, the emblems and the great seal and how it lines up literally with the stars, with Aquila, the dolphin there, the lyre, um, the fox, all the, co the constellations all over there by Aquila in the sky, all allude to the founding emblems right there in America and the literal things you can see right there in Washington, D.C. That was amazing information that's laid out very easy to follow in the Antichrist for Dummies video, so I highly recommend to watch it there. Don't want to get into it. But right here, it says, America is clearly designated by the eagle's nest, as it is the only part of the world where the bald eagle, the arms of the United States, is to be found. And just like the... There is... I'm sorry. There was... A, um. I lost my train of thought. Oh, in the ancient history of Caledonia, there was a native animal to there, a cow, who was completely white head to toe. Every bit of it was white, but it had a black tongue. And as the national animal, if you will, of the Caledonian territory, that was very reminiscent of them, who were altogether a very pious, righteous people. But they had a mouth on them that got them in trouble. And you can see it in there even to today, if you know where to look with their some of their descendants. But um, right here, the bald eagle is America, reminiscent and alluding to us. The ideals are, are alluded to are perfect. They're white. They're great, you know, things of the mind. But the practices... The actual body of this thing is brown. It, it is soiled. And that is most certainly something that you can see in our country if you ever take the time to actually be honest with yourself. Which is another thing that is a rather interesting phenomenon. Scripture tells us that he created everything, his wonders in the creation, and those are literally his messengers. Everything created is a messenger to teach us including the emblems for different countries and whatnot. But it says, Thus, this hitherto inexplicable prophecy may now be easily understood as meaning that when the cock, that is France, shall protect America, as she did during the late war, the stars, that is the standard of the American empire, shall rise in this western part of the world which is exactly what happened, okay? Verse 6, it is very remarkable that the first discovery of the amazing properties of inflammable air, what we call helium, okay, by means of which men have been able to explore a region till then impervious to them, the sky, happened in the same year when Britain's strength was so reduced as to oblige her to acknowledge the independence of America. The boats in which the adventurous aeronauts traversed the upper regions are the ships here referred to. Thus far, the foretelling seems to have been already fully and literally accomplished. It is to be hoped that the accomplishment of those which remain is not far remote. And that was from the gentleman who wrote that and put it in the article back in the 1700s when it was in the middle of happening, right? Verse 7, I understand to mean that when the sea, Neptune's back, is red with American stripes, the naval power of Britain shall decline. A proper exertion in the art of shipbuilding would soon produce this effect. And whenever Congress is vested with the power of regulating the commerce of America, we may hope to see the full accomplishment of this prediction. Verse 8, this oracle clearly alludes to the, an epoch not far removed, as we may hope, for when the 13 United States shall, under the auspices of the present federal convention, present federal 
convention, which is what produced the Constitution, okay? Having strengthened and cemented their union by a proper revisal of the Articles of Confederation, so as to be really but one nation, when the seven and six become one, 76 and one, okay? Which is another thing, the 76%, uh, that illusion, that number is also in Revelation in chapter 12, where you can do the math and 76% of the text is fighting. <clears throat> This is, but Britain will no longer be able to maintain that rank and consequence among the nations of the earth, which she had hitherto done. Meaning that she would no longer be the nation and company of nations that were uh, of that superpower, right? This is also shown in 4th Ezra, which also alludes to the eagle, if you will, as America being part of that eagle. In Europe, you have the two eagles and the crown usually in the middle. But in 4th Ezra, it mentions the three-headed eagle is that fourth beast that's ruling until our Mashiach comes. And one of those heads is when they've been using America, first Britain, and then America, to subdue the world back to Rome. And we first find the illusion of that in foretelling in the life of Yahusuf or who they called Joseph, where again, after he was sold into captivity by his brothers and he was imprisoned, he was made a slave and then imprisoned. After he was released from prison, he was set at the right hand of Pharaoh and he was second only to him and subdued all the land, all the peoples, all the resources to Pharaoh. And that was an illusion of Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Yahusuf, Britain and America, being used for that very same purpose in a worldwide scale for Rome. <clears throat> this is another allusion to that. And that's what I mean, where you can, this is where you don't have to just believe one thing. These are multiple witnesses, all foretelling the same events in different ways that you can say, it's the truth. You can acknowledge that it's there, or you can lie to yourself and ignore it but i don't recommend doing things like that since the publication of this explanation the fulfillment of the last two has become a part and portion of our history the neptune's back is red with the stripes and we may add stars every child knows and the sickly lion already hides his head, not only beneath the folds of our flag, but plays second fiddle to the cock of France. Shalom as well. The eighth is fully accomplished and 76, the when the seven and six become one, right? And 76, as well as the 7 and 6, which makes 13, which is the, the number for Manasseh. He was the 13th tribe, if you will. Form a pleasing illustration of the prophecy, as they do one of the most interesting, interesting incidents in our history. The 13 states, 7 and 6, have multiplied nearly thrice since the Declaration of Independence and are now, as then, but one, united. And that was that unity that Abraham Lincoln was fighting so desperately to keep, that people speak evil and think that it was the state's rights and this and that. The people had the will to form the states, to form the union. The state does not have the right to, to chomp at the bit against the will of the people any more than anyone in the federal government should do so. It's the constitutions that bind the, the people that are public servants to them. And it's because we don't know what they actually are or how things actually are supposed to work and that we are in national sin that our enemies are allowed to have rule over us. But as soon as we repent, 
of the keeping of the Christmas, of the of the Sunday keeping, of the institution of things on Shabbat as a nation and as individuals, our enemies will have no power to do anything to us. If we don't repent, though, you're giving yourself to the one you, you love. Love the truth, right? <clears throat> and it says, and that one, a nation. Walter Scott, speaking of Merlin or the savage, as he was called, says the particular spot in which he is buried is still shown and appears from the following quotation taken from a description of Tweeddale, 1715, to have partaken of his prophetic qualities. This is at his gravesite. When Tweed and Pussell meet at Merlin's grave, Scotland and England shall one monarch have. For the same day that our King James the Sixth was crowned King of England, and that was the 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 seed of Kadoshi McIsaac's sister, who was a Macdonald, uh, but she married the Stuart right she married the stewart of the romans and founded the stewart line of butte he was james stewart who was the sixth of england the first or the sixth of scotland the first of england and it was woe to the caledonians when he came to the reign because he was intolerable to the real belief he adopted the high church party's mixture and told the others leave and that's what actually caused him to flee to begin with if you recall <clears throat> but we get a spin that he was great he was persecuted by jesuits and the plot just got foiled and somehow he never they never tried again but look at the history of all the monarchs that balked against the little horn they were constantly attacked until the day they were either killed or they died there was no leeway there was no give It says, for the same day that our King James VI was crowned King of England, the river Tweed, by an extraordinary flood, or extraordinary, right, so far overflowed its banks that it met and joined with the po the Pausel at the said grave, which was never before observed to fall out. The precise spot pointed out to travelers is situated near Drummelzir, or Drummelzir, a village upon the Tweed. All right, and then this is significant. Not a lot of people know about this, but I want to share with you because this is actually when our country got its liberty and how it happened. The Declaration of Independence did not declare us independent. It was an act of Congress by the will of the people. The Declaration of Independence was our writing, stating the causes of what we did and sharing it for the, for the world to view. But this is actually where things happened. So it says, 4th of July, 1776, the first motion in Congress was to declare this country independent. The first assembling of the Revolutionary Congress took place in this city on the 5th of September, 1774. Subsequently, the progress of the war continued to ripen the public mind and feelings for a total separation from Great Britain. It was not, however, until the 7th of June, 1776, that any special action was had for that purpose. On that day, Richard Henry Lee, a delegate from Virginia, made the following motion, which was seconded by John Adams, quote, to declare these united colonies free and independent states, that they are dissolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, that measures should be immediately taken for procuring assistance of foreign powers, and that a confederation be formed to bind the colonies more closely together. And that confederation was the... the the first, the Confederated Conference that they got together, and then that later worked out to become the Constitution. But it was by the consent of the governed, by the will of the people, top down with the people being on top is the primary thing here. 
On the following day, the subject was debated, and on the 1st of July, a committee consisting of five delegates, Messrs. Jefferson, Adams, Franklin, R. Sherman, and R. R. Lawrence, was selected by ballot to draft a Declaration of Independence. I can't speak for everyone here. I don't know. I believe Jefferson has a K. Um, Hapla group is his male, which means he would have been a Phoenician uh, descent, a Hebrew through the Phoenician line. Adams was of the tribe of Yahuda from the line of Zerah, but they also had intermarried with the Irish kings of the sons of Louis that had intermarried with the line of Dawid from Taitafi. So they had the sons of Dawid from their maternal line in the Adams family as well. But he was a Yahuda from Zerah. I don't know about Franklin or Sherman. Lawrence is in the ancient history of Caledonia, and the Lawrences are from the sons of uh, McLaurin, who is the son of Louis or a Levite, if you will, and of the Cohen line. But these were people in our country. They had no idea about that, and most people have no idea about that. However, all of us are Hebrews. That's the point. I'm trying to I'm trying to point out literal seed of Abraham here hasn't changed, and it's not the only people who are. But it says these five were selected by ballot to draft a Declaration of Independence. According to parliamentary usage, Mr. Lee would have been the chairman of this committee. But he was absent in Vir Virginia on account of the illness of a member of his family. Mr. Jefferson, however, having the greatest number of votes, was selected by the other members of the committee to act as chairman. And the draft prepared by him was first read in committee. I actually have this draft um, in the books by Charles Wilcox. There's one called Perverting the Promised Land. And the other one is called the uh, the president, the priest, and the papacy, if I remember. Both of them are in regards to the overthrow of our country and Rome's complicity in there. I mean, literal hidden evidence. Charles Chiniqui, his archives of his evidence and, and the things that he had, the actual proofs for things for their conspiracy to overthrow our country. It was given to him after 120 years, the family heir bequeathed it to Charles Wilcox in the event that he would make it public. So he's written these books, and in there, he also has the actual declaration, the, the draft that was made by Thomas Jefferson and edited by Franklin Adams. It is significantly more... Um, more powerful than the version that we currently have and it's a tragedy that we didn't have that actually put through in its entirety. But Father Willing, we're going to read that together sometime, and you you, you guys will be blown away. <clears throat> Either way, it says, Mr. Jefferson, however, uh, he read his first. Some verbal alterations were made by Dr. Franklin and Mr. Adams, and that's the, the version that I have in his book, right? And it was not thought necessary to read the drafts prepared by the others. It was stated at the time that the other members of the committee were so pleased with Mr. Jefferson's draft that they would not submit theirs even for consideration. Perhaps no higher compliment was ever paid to the author of our Declaration of Independence than that which emanated from the gentleman who composed this committee. But he was quickly offended by the uh, the editing that was done, and he never forgave them the the responsible parties for that. It does it took a significant portion out, and it it's the once you read it, you'll see that it was what helped perpetuate the slavery in the country to cause the divide and conquer and the infighting. That war, the separation of the states it was to destroy the union and the popular government and this this liberty of conscience that was being fostered here was the entire point of that holy alliance by rome 
and Satan's whole goal with with what they're doing to overthrow our nation. <clears throat> and this is provable. This is the point I'm trying to make here. It says, the declaration thus prepared and amended was finally adopted in Congress on the 4th and was read to a meeting of the citizens of Philadelphia assembled at the state or house yard from the steps of the building. In or the house in which Mr. Jefferson wrote the declaration is still standing at the southwest corner of 7th and Market Streets. Mr. Jefferson had rooms in it as a lodger when a member of the Congress of 76. Two days before the adoption of the, dec of the declaration and its promulgation, Mr. Adams, in a letter addressed to his wife, makes use of the following language. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the Grand Anniversary Festival. It ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to El Shaddai, to El Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp, shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations. And for a while there, they've done everything they can to get people just not to celebrate, right? To make it seem like, ah, oh, we, should, we should be ashamed for one reason or another. But it was a deliverance of the Almighty for our people that they were wanting to commemorate. And illuminations from one end of the continent to the other from this time forward and forever. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and to support and defend the states. Yet through all the gloom, I can see the rays of light and glory. I can see that the end is more than worth all the means and that posterity will triumph, although you and I may rue it, which I hope we shall not. And then if you actually look at what happened with the signers of the Declaration, many of them did lose their life, liberty, and property for their declaring that. It says, when the bell sounded forth from the steeple of the old state house, the first pill for liberty gave new life to the citizens from lip to lip, from street to street, from city, town, and thorough through the country, away, away the words roll like waves of the ocean, and reverberating like the roar of the wind as undulating, it passed through all space. The city of Philadelphia on the afternoon of July 4th, 1776, presented to view a city convulsed, joy united with patriotism, and then the word freedom became the watchword. All right, it goes on to show <laughs> that uh, they actually broke down an equestrian, a statue of George III on a horse, and they used the fragments to make bullets, right? And later on, there's another footnote here that in 1778, when they ran out of cartridge paper, they were looking all over for something, and they found a sermon from a gentleman stockpiled in Benjamin Franklin's old printing press about defensive war. And they used that for the, the, the paper they needed for their cartridges. But um, this is the page that's actually missing in the PDF. I have it on the hard copy here. And we don't really have time to go any further in this for today. So I'm not going to pursue it. But he actually goes into a little more detail about the founding of our country. Um, in some places, it's pretty interesting. However, right here... It kind of breaks off and then it goes into the liberty tree and what that was about. So we actually covered most everything that I wanted to share. If you give me just one moment, I will find uh, the relevant scripture here. All right. Now, allusions in scripture to America, when it talks about the wilderness, that's a big one. The great wilderness is what America was first called by William Bradford when he came here as an allusion to the woman that was going off to the wilderness for a time. So the allusions in scripture about the wilderness is about America. 
in particular, when the children were taken out of Mitzrayim and wandering the wilderness where they were doing things that angered him, that's exactly what we're doing right now. It is that illusion. All right. We are the offensive party. If we if we don't repent, you're not making it to the promised land kind of thing. It's it's that kind of serious deal. But that's the wilderness that's alluded to there. It's also mentioned like Yirmiyahu 48, where it talks about the dove. Or you have, um, he talks about he knew you in the wilderness in the land of drought in Hosea. Okay. It mentions the dove in the wilderness in the book of Psalms. All right. The, the dove in the cleft of the rock, right, in the Song of Songs. This is the allusion to America, the country that's founded on liberty of conscience. The First Amendment of the Bill of Rights of the Constitution was supposed to enumerate the essence of that in the Virginia Constitution that predates our federal constitution. It predates the Declaration of Independence, and it has elements from it in them. Okay. It goes into even more detail about that. But liberty of conscience is supreme. Another witness for that is Charles Chiniqui himself in his 50 years in the Church of Rome, where he talks about how the liberty of conscience that every man is supposed to bleed and die for in our nation is anathemized by Rome. It's the thing that they are seeking to destroy above everything, which is why our country is in such a mess. <clears throat> But there is one in particular, and I can't find it here. The the dove in the wilderness is mentioned in the Psalms, and that was the one I really wanted to point to. See, I would wander far off. I would lodge in the wilderness, say law. That's 55-7. But that's not the one. Yes. Who would give me the wings like a dove? I would fly away and be at rest. That's Psalm 55. Those are the illusions of the, the coming to America where they fled their brother, did, didn't fight against him, but just fled and went to a, where they can have space to keep, keep the Torah. That was the goal. But our forefathers, you know, through war and successive things of not doing that, through Satan's minions intentionally getting us to go along with being contrary to his word, we are under judgment by him for violating our oath to him. The Constitution and the Declaration, these are, these are contracts with the Almighty and our government, right? But these are agreements that the men of our country are king, and we will keep his law as supreme, and then everything's supposed to work right so father willing everyone that's in america we can start seeing our nation is is an amazing thing that we're losing because we're doing evil and it's literally repenting by turning back to his word just like the children of old that will save us today so thank you for your time you have a wonderful rest of your shabbat and a shavuot tov and we will see you next time